What made you want to write this piece about guns? A lot of different things, yeah. but uh, my brother was a big gun owner, very enthusiastic about guns, which was weird because yeah. nobody in my family cares about guns. And we were like, oh, where did this come from? Yeah. And I, he kept trying to get my other brother and I to buy a gun, and we were like, oh, no, we're good. And <laughs> finally, he broke us all down. And so I got my first gun. Yeah. And one of the things I noticed at the gun store and at the gun range was that there were a lot of people of color and black yeah. women in particular. Yeah. And so I thought, why are black women buying guns? Yeah. Other than the obvious. <laughs> <laughs> well, why are black women buying guns? Black women, I think, are buying guns simply because we often recognize that if we don't protect ourselves, no one else will. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's that we don't trust that the police will come to our homes and protect us. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Sonia Massey's murder recently bears that out among yeah. many others. Yeah. And so I think it's not a form of empowerment, which I think is overused and cheesy, but it is a form of protection and yeah. recognizing that sometimes you have to take your own defense in your own hands. There's something beautiful about a bunch of white male forefathers 260 years ago <laughs> not envisioning black and brown people at the shooting range? I know. Um, <laughs> was it beautiful? Was, was that... Uh, I mean, I think that there's a lot to be said about the founders yeah. and their lack of vision. Yeah. I mean, people always talk about... <laughs> no, I mean... <laughs> how much vision they have, You but... mentioned it in the essay that the Second Amendment wasn't written for black people. It wasn't written for black people. It wasn't written for women. They saw us as only three-fifths of a person, so I guess we could only use three-fifths of a musket. <laughs> but... <laughs> Now, you know, if the Second Amendment applies to white men, it applies to all of us. Yeah. And yeah. I, you know. Um, do you, I mean, what's fun about this essay is it's not you writing about people that own guns. You, you bought a gun. I did. In fact, your first gun, the Beretta, <laughs> was a little too big. Then you it bought a different gun. It was just so big. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the pole vaulter. <laughs> What can you do? Yeah. Um, what's it like buying a gun? I know that a lot, you know half the country's going to hear that question and laugh and go, I, "Do you not." But there's a lot of people that don't. Are, I had are no of idea. Them, or even know how to buy a gun. What was it like buying a gun for you? Well, I live in California most of the time, and so it's a kind of a pain. Mm -hmm. But it should be like it should be. It's really a pain to buy a gun. You to mean. buy a gun. Yeah, it's yes. also a pain it's for a other whole reasons. Process. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have to take a little test, which is yep. fine. It's like the driver's exam. You study the booklet in their car beforehand. Right. And, <laughs> and you uh, fill out an application, you get a background check, mm -hmm. and then 10 days after you do all of that, you can pick up the gun, which I think is great. Take us some time, really think through, yeah. like, do I really need this? Yeah. Or am I angry? I mean, a gun destroys things. It does. It takes people's lives. It causes grievous injuries. You know, we talk a lot about the people who die from gun violence, but there are people whose lives are irrevocably, irrevocably changed because of really bad injuries, mm -hmm. the loss of limbs, the loss of organs. Mm -hmm. And so you really have to think very carefully about why you would welcome a weapon like this into your home, but yeah. we don't have children. If we right. had children, it would be a complete non-starter. Well, how did you, and maybe I'm asking selfishly, how did you, or was it hard to convince your wife to have a gun in the house? No, surprisingly. Okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> but, but, but that's another consideration. It isn't just your It was 100% a consideration. And, yeah, yeah. If she said no, the answer would be no. Yeah. But she's a lifelong New Yorker. Okay. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> she's not afraid of a good fight. And <laughs> she's like, why well, do I need a gun when I'm a New Yorker? I'll do all she my She does fists. not need a gun yeah. at all. <laughs> she doesn't even need her fist. She okay. has a very capable <laughs> mouth. Okay. Um, <laughs> What, 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 I'm just gonna leave that there. What has, <laughs> what did you learn that maybe you, you weren't expecting about America's gun epidemic in this process? I learned so much. Oh, interesting. And I think everyone, I mean, we read the statistics every single time there is yeah. a horrific crime and nothing ever changes. But there are more guns than people in this country. Nuts. Which cannot possibly be the case, but yet it yeah. is. Yeah. And only about 35% of Americans own guns, which is to say that the people who own guns really, really love their guns, mm -hmm. and they own a whole lot of them. Mm -hmm. And that really surprised me, because... When you listen to the NRA and other lobbyists talk about gun ownership, they really make it seem like everyone's kind of like walking around with a gun in their purse mm -hmm. or in the back of their jeans, and that's not the case, mm -hmm. and nor should it be. And yet, 
that's what we hear that so many people own guns. No, it's a choice that some people make, and yeah. yet those people get a disproportionate amount of our cultural attention. One thing that really resonated with me in the essay was when you went to the shooting range and you you almost uh, you were mentioning the shooting instructor Raul. I'm mm -hmm. not how obsessed he was with safety. Yes. And I loved hearing that. Oh yeah. And he I was think so hardcore. But I mean, this is that this side of gun ownership isn't always told. A lot of responsible gun owners are obsessed with safety. Mm -hmm. Share a little bit of that experience with you. For there. sure. When you hear about gun violence in general, it's irresponsible gun owners. Yeah. It's people who don't know how to handle it properly. But before we even went to the range, we took some classes because we're nerds. <laughs> and we sat in an actual classroom. Yeah. And he was like, here are the four rules of gun safety. Write it down. Yeah. Which I did. Yeah. <laughs> and it was really heartening to see that there is a responsible way to go about this, mm -hmm. that you don't have to be casual, you don't have to be careless, mm -hmm. and you can protect not only yourselves, but the people in your household and also your community by being responsible. And also, you know, locking up your guns. Do you feel safer owning a gun? No, not really. Yeah. But that's because I know what happens to legal gun ownership for black people when the police are involved. Yeah. So, well, not let, necessarily. But I do feel like I get a lot of death threats. That's what precipitates. Well, yeah, buying that's a what gun. I want. I mean, what you know, I have friends that say they own guns for um, d uh, defense of their home, and I kind of laugh because I go, "You live on ten acres. <laughs> you don't even have a neighbor." <laughs> but when you were describing in the book that you get true death threats and people. Uh, threatening your wife, that's different now. It's different, and it starts to get closer and closer to home. And as the threats became more and more specific, particularly during COVID, I just thought, man, am I going to sit around and wait for something to happen right. or not? But right. the thing that makes me feel most safe is we also got a dog right. uh, during COVID, and yeah. he weighs nine pounds. <laughs> Yeah. And thinks he weighs 90, and he lets us know when someone's even thinking about the house. It. And so yeah. that's actually what makes me feel safe. Like, I don't know if I can stop something, but Max, our dog, Maximus Toretto Blueberry, um, <laughs> he's absolutely going to let us know. I mean, in some states, there's more regulations about dog adoption than getting a gun. Yes, right? and in some states, women have more rights as gun owners than they do as women or people with uteruses. Um, you know, you wrote that black gun ownership is definitely a political act. White gun ownership is generally taken as an inalienable right. Explain that to me. Absolutely. We tend to look at the Bill of Rights, I almost said the Ten Commandments. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know. <laughs> they're getting closer and closer, yeah. And, uh, you know, we treat those Bill of Rights as inalienable, but the further you get from a white, heterosexual, cisgender man, the f more you have to fight for those rights and yeah. the more you are considered sort of an anomaly when you choose to avail yourself of those rights. Mm. And I'm not the kind of person who's going to wrap myself in the Second Amendment. I think that no one should be able to own a gun, and if they want to come take it, like, feel free. But <laughs> that said, as long as the right is there, I think there are many black gun owners who say, why not? Mm -hmm. And some people are shooting enthusiasts, some mm -hmm. people are concerned with self-defense mm -hmm. and home protection, and uh, there's room for all of that. We contain multitudes. I love in your essay you reminded all of us that the Second Amendment is 27 words. It is. Which it is. It's shocking given how often people talk about it. I mean, it's kind of like, hey guys, we need a little more clarity here. <laughs> You would think. You would We'd think. be like a little more specific, but yeah. also in 1787 when they were writing those 27 words, a musket took like a long time to yes. load. Yeah. And it only shot one bullet at a time. I don't think that the founding fathers could have begun to imagine yeah. what that gun would become. Yeah. yeah. And the fact that we decided collectively that we were okay with not regulating weapons of mass destruction is something that astonishes me every single day. Let's talk about Stand Your Ground. And, um, you know, you, you, you dive into it in the essay. It feels kind of f***ed up, actually, when you start to think, oh, we actually put a law on the books that you're allowed to kill mm -hmm. somebody. Um, should it, you know, it, should it be more inclusive? Should it be taken off the books? I mean, what, 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 what is a thought you have on Stand Your Ground? Well, I think it should be more specific. Mm -hmm. And I think that if it applies to one person, it should apply to everyone. Right. Like, um, George Zimmerman yeah. used Stand Your Ground as his excuse for killing Trayvon Martin. Yeah. But Marissa Alexander 
also you stand your ground. She was a legal gun owner who shot in the air away from her former partner who was menacing her and with against mm -hmm. whom she had a restraining order. And she spent five years in jail and house under house arrest right. because of that. And so when black people try to stand their ground in general, it is used against them. And so that's really what we have to change. Yeah. But I also don't think we should be given carte blanche to take other people's lives. Yeah. Uh, so you, you, it's a you, tough thing. You painted, well, you shared a lot of examples that I was unfamiliar with, and it's a great read. Uh, Kamala Harris, mm -hmm. how you feeling? I'm feeling great. As a black, as, <laughs> as, as a black woman, as a feminist, as a gun owner, I don't know if that pertains. It, uh, it actually <laughs> doesn't pertain doesn't at all. Doesn't pertain, okay. However, I think that I wasn't really advocating for Biden to step down, but I was excited when he did. I think that Vice President Harris is going to be a very interesting president. I think we have an opportunity. For so long, we've been told we have to wait till 2025, 2024, 2032, 2040, who knows, for real political change. And even in the run up to Harris becoming the nominee, people were saying that she's not a viable candidate. Like, what about Gavin Newsom? Mm -hmm. What about Gretchen Whitmer? And so I think it is a real interesting moment to consider who is Kamala Harris and what kind of president would she be? And we don't just have to uncritically engage with her. I think we can ask her genuine political questions yeah. about where she stands on the major issues we're dealing with right now, whether it's Gaza, Ukraine, reproductive freedom here in the country, transgender rights, and it's a very long list. But I am encouraged. I think she's going to do the job extremely well. I don't think that she's going to make everyone happy, but I don't think that's possible for a yeah. president. Yeah. And look at the alternative. <laughs> thank you for talking with us. Thank you. Uh, the original ebook and audiobook, Stand Your Ground, is available only on Everend. Roxanne Gay.